So today I am delighted to present our speaker for our colloquia series. Dr. Eric Novak is from 4D Technologies right here in Tucson, Arizona. Um, Dr. Novak has been Director of Business Development at 4D Technologies since 2013. He received his PhD in Optical Sciences from the University of Arizona in 1998. He has been developing instrumentation for precision metrology for more than 24 years in applications including displays, optical films, aerospace, automotive, photovoltaics, and medical devices. He has developed systems and techniques for interferometry, confocal microscopy, stylus systems, spec uh, spectrometry, Raman imaging, and more. Um, Dr. Novak's received five R&D 100 awards, holds over a dozen patents, and has had more than 60 publications and book chapters related to surface measurement and industrial process control. And today he's going to be giving us a colloquia on snapshot technologies for measurement of 3D surfaces. So take it away. scratch the surface and you know mostly I'll go with what I'm uh, comfortable with but uh, we'll talk a little bit about various uh, metrology techniques that are out there for 3D surface measurements um, then we'll dive a little more into you know how to use those techniques on smooth or mirror-like surfaces like optics semiconductors a lot of medical devices uh, talk about extension into rough surface measurement and general machining parts uh, spend a couple of slides then talking about how technologies become products and some of the key considerations there that you should think about and then a uh, quick slide on conclusions. So you know, I hope you guys have a lot of time today. It's, it's no more than like 130, 140 <laughs> slides, so it's all good. Um, well, oh, is it, is it, I thought I unmuted it. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different uh, types of surface uh, measurement instruments for 3D measurements. Uh, the most common out there in the world are CMMs. It's something like a four billion dollar a year market. And what those are is essentially big gantry systems with a touch probe. The touch probe will move around the system, you know, give you form information, radius, critical dimensioning, and everything else. Um, if you get into more uh, needing surface roughness measurements or smaller systems or more single line measurements, uh, there's stylus profilers. Uh, and then you get more into the optical techniques that are non-contact. And so those can be scanning laser systems, uh, stereography systems, fringe projection, uh, deflectometry, and then laser interferometers. And today we're going to talk more about some of the latter uh, systems, ones that are area-based techniques and optically based, you know, based on our audience. And you'll have to forgive me, I know there's varying sophistication here, so I'm going to start like I'm talking to, you know, any group, and uh, most of you guys are familiar with fringes, but one of the things people like, you know, kind of about this slide is it's a different way of, you know, explaining it to other people if you're ever trying to explain interferometry. And really, any fringe-based technique is using a very similar uh, method. So every bright or dark band um, is following a path of equal height. And the only thing that really differs between systems is essentially how the bands are made, which determines the spacing. And typically, you're able to resolve somewhere around 1 1,000th of the spacing of the bands. And so the easiest you know, analogy outside of optics is to think of a topo map where you're looking at mountains and cliffs and everything, and it's exactly the same thing. There each band is 100 feet, and so when they're closely spaced, it's a cliff, and flat, you know, widely spaced, it's a plateau. Uh, same in interferometry. The more dense they are, the steeper the surface. Um, and, but you know, instead of 100 feet, we're talking 300 nanometers um, as a typical uh, spacing between fringes. Uh, one of the techniques that's used for big aerial measurements, and it gets a whopping one slide here, so this is uh, more an exercise for the interested student, as they say, to find out more, but uh, the Mirror Lab has used it pretty successfully in Jim Burge, is deflectometry. And here, you know, we're going to create fringes 
uh, with a television screen, with a projector. It could be, you know, if you wanted a, a translucent piece of paper with a, a light behind it. But uh, you're going to have very broadly spaced fringes, you know, usually centimeters uh, of spacing. Um, you're going to project them onto a part. In this case, it's a car door. And how the shape bends um, and how you're viewing it, uh, you can use those two things to get a 3D surface map. And so this is a really powerful technique. You'll see it all over uh, in, in the automotive world in, uh, you know, measuring large parts. And uh, it's great for, you know, gross shape measurements. It can actually handle a, a fairly wide variety of surface reflectivities uh, depending on how you're doing it. And, uh, and it gives essentially very quick results, uh, you know, with normal fringing, you know, just like any others, you generally take multiple exposures here before you get a 3D result. But then if you move into interferometry, you go from the widely spaced fringes to basically the most finely spaced fringes. And, um, you know, this audience, you know, is I'm sure quite familiar that essentially an interferometer um, measures the coherent addition of two light beams. So you take a source, you split it in two, um, you recombine them, and what you image, you're going to get uh, juxtaposition of the two beams. And essentially, when you uh, solve for the phase, you can actually get very precise surface heights. Uh, if you guys haven't seen this slide, I think it's been around for a good 20-some years. Uh, but, you know, the, the standard schematic of a Twyman Green interferometer, the light comes out, it's split by a beam splitter, it goes off the two surfaces, it gets recombined, and we get our fringes. And what we ultimately measure is the difference in path between the test and the reference arm. So the better the reference, uh, the better the result, unless you're going to back calculate out the error corrections. And, uh, you know, interferometry has been around forever. I still remember, I think, one of the first things Jim said in my first interferometry course is the only thing that's changed in the last several hundred years is software uh, associated with interferometers. But um, sadly, even when, when I got started, there were still people uh, measuring fringes by hand. And you've probably done that in homework and estimated out the errors, and you can kind of get to a tenth of the wavelength of light by looking at the deviations and saying, all right, yeah, that's half a fringe, so it's a 150 nanometer deviation, plus or minus, not so sure. Then temporal phase shifting came around in uh, the 80s, essentially, commercially, and uh, you get very high precision, so you, you're going to manipulate the beams, and we'll see that. And now I can get to lambda by 1,000 very easily in, uh, in well-controlled environments and uh, get very good results. And then, you know, starting uh, within about the last 15, 20 years, uh, you have dynamic phase shifting capability where you get the 3D information in a single camera frame. And what that does is it allows you, in good environments, you can drive down your noise even further than before. In bad environments, you can get measurements where they were otherwise impossible. And we'll talk mostly about that here today. So, again, temporal uh, phase shift interferometry you know, produces three-dimensional three data. So you take a single fringe frame. You don't know whether things are hills or valleys or how things are sloped, but I can phase shift it, and I get the classic... Uh, uh, tangential relationship, and then uh, the height is related to the phase there. Of course, no one in the world actually uses a four-frame technique except in class because the math works out nicely. Uh, but you, essentially, you need at least three frames. Typically, people will use five to eight because you get some interesting compensation. But at any rate, you solve for the phase of the fringes at every single pixel, and you get a height map of the surface. So that works excellently in controlled environments. So you put things on an air isolation table, so your uh, phase shift is the only thing making the fringes move. You shorten your optical pass. You wrap everything with a lot of bubble wrap so there's no turbulence. 
um, physically couple your test piece, um, you know, make sure everyone's quiet, make sure your boss doesn't come in and lean, lean on the table, which is probably the most common source of error. And, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and if you need to measure something biological, you better kill it first, uh, which might cause problems in certain situations. But again, you're going to get extremely precise data, uh, sub-nanometer level data in a good environment. But dynamic interferometry, you know, the whole purpose is to remove the environment from the measurement as much as possible. So the goal is single frame data capture. And then you're really only limited in terms of what the environment's doing by the pulse or the exposure time of the camera. So you can get more than a thousand times faster than temporal systems if you have a high powered source, uh, a good camera, and you become insensitive to typical vibration sources and uh, no need for isolation tables. And it allows measurement virtually anywhere and we'll see some different situations there. But you know, with large mirrors uh, where your test instrument has to be maybe 100 meters or more from your uh, uh, mirror that you're trying to evaluate. Uh, you can do on-machine measurements in polishing systems. You can do uh, measurements of moving or living things, vibrating things. And, uh, and then there's some interesting stuff. Well, I was asked the other day, someone was really worried. They said, well, you know, with a single frame system, I still have the effect of uh, air turbulence or airflow in my system and uh, and that's really slowly varying so even if I average um, you know things aren't going to work out very good and you know we nicely told them that with dynamic interferometry it's the opposite of everything else you want to put a big fan right in your optical path and it can vibrate and but the goal is to churn up the air as quickly as possible now I can take maybe 10 exposures um, each of which individually are vibration insensitive and all the air turbulence goes away because it averages out. So it's kind of the exact opposite of, you know, everyone leave the room and everyone be quiet. You want people uh, churning the air and fans and things as much as possible. So there's some different ways to accomplish uh, single frame or, you know, uh, vibration immune interferometry. And one of the simplest actually is a spatial carrier technique. So if I'm not worried about getting super high spatial frequency and I have something fairly smooth, I can add a lot of tilt fringes and now instead of doing a phase shift or something, I can do a, fa a phase calculation across the fringes in this direction. And I can create the tilt so that there's a 90 degree phase shift between pixels and then every four pixels gives me a phase and I just march that calculation across and I can get a surface map. Uh, in this case I was using an incoherent source so the fringes go away either side of focus so I only get a narrow band. But you can do some really cool things there and you can get your phase back using just traditional uh, you know four frame algorithms. You can use Fourier methods and everything else. Uh, there's some tricks here though. Your system has to be designed to perform well at high tilts. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of aberrations and errors. So a lot of times you have uh, special, specially designed optics. Uh, you want higher quality flats. Uh, you want to make sure you understand focus dependence and things like that. But the, you know, the technique's been around a long time. It was first commercialized in 90 uh, uh, by uh, Michael Kukul at Zeiss. And one of the cool things you can do then is here's a little interferometer that uses spatial carrier techniques. You can actually mount it over something like a roller that's doing plastic electronics and you can get a real-time map of the surface as it goes by. And so people are using this to map defects, do roughness calculations and things like that. So down here you see a defect table uh, that's uh, tracking things. So it's pretty cool and again, you know, vibration is no issue. Uh, you need things to stay within a given focus range. In this case, it was about, you know, 50 microns before the fringes, you know, left the camera. But uh, you can, you know, get, you know, huge amounts of data. So with a system like this, if you compare it to like a 3D microscope system that's going to take single fields of view, 
uh, you can get you know 4,000 times more coverage in a given unit of time than you do with a microscope-based system. Another way, and this is kind of where 4D um, has specialized to get uh, the phase shift and the phase information is by employing polarization. So if you have two circularly polarized beams and they're oppositely polarized, they're not going to interfere uh, until you put a linear polarizer there. And then I actually get uh, interference between the two beams and I can get a nice fringe pattern. And if I rotate this polarizer, uh, the, f the fringe pattern uh, phase shifts. And so I can think of using multiple polarizers. Uh, and here's one of the early uh, attempts at that uh, that was successful. So I come in with my light. So from the test and reference, they're oppositely polarized. I have polarizing beam splitters and, uh, and multiple cameras. So each of these, there's some, rotator, uh, some elements in there to, to rotate the polarization. But each camera fundamentally sees a different phase. And I can get single frame or, you know, simultaneous, anyway, uh, phase shifting. Now, this isn't obviously the easiest thing to align. Uh, every camera has to be perfectly aligned with the other ones in terms of spatially, tilt, everything else. There's a lot of non-common path optics in here that can affect things. So it's not the ideal uh, solution, but sure enough, it works and was able to get good data. Kind of the latest iteration of that, you know, uh, what are we talking about uh, from 84 to uh, 2004, so 20 years later, uh, we were able to use actual uh, semiconductor techniques to make a semiconductor mask of micropolarizers that goes on the detector array. So every pixel of the detector ultimately has a different polarizer in front of it, just like every pixel on your phone has a color filter on it, a bare filter. So instead of getting you know, a color image from a black and white camera in a single frame, we're getting a 3D image from a black and white camera in a single frame. And uh, it's tricky to align, but once you do, uh, it's great because everything in the system um, you know, coming in is typically uh, you know, common as you know, common path as it can be, and you wind up with good results. So what that looks like in practice a little bit is we come in, we're going to split the two beams into opposite polarizations. Uh, they come down, they both hit the camera. These polarizers each will produce a different phase shift on each pixel. And again, we just apply the standard four frame algorithms and we're able to uh, get good results. Now here a four frame algorithm is actually pretty appropriate because we don't have to worry about using more frames to compensate for vibration and such. And what can you do with that? You can do all sorts of cool things. This is actually uh, the eye of uh, James Millard, our president, being measured in uh, real time, essentially. I don't know why this, uh, this should have been a video as well, but I guess that's part of the quirkiness of uh, the projection system. But you can actually see it, and this is for uh, use for tear film measurements. And, and other measurements of the deformation of the eye. Uh, you can also do things like strain measurements. So if I have a test piece and I'm actuating it with a transducer, I can actually now do dynamic measurements and get modal analysis so I can see what's going on dynamically under different, uh, different conditions. So this was using a 5,000 frame per second uh, interferometer. Uh, and then, uh, you know, this was moving at 400 hertz. Another really cool application, this is actually a live heart cell. And we were looking at drug um, sensitivity. So you can see two curves here. Uh, one is before the drug is administered. The heart, was, the heart cells were kind of beating a little bit, uh, but not very strongly and uh, not as frequently as after the drug was administered. And what we're looking here, essentially, if you look at the phase of a cell, you're essentially looking at its mass. So it's how the cell mass is changing over time is what we're measuring. And uh, cell mass directly correlates to cell health. So you can actually do things like determine whether a cell is cancerous or not by 
its elasticity and also by certain characteristics of cell mass with uh, regards to other cells. Get into a few different uh, interferometer configurations here just to show you, you know, when dynamic interferometry, uh, you know, is appropriate and some of the different things you can do with it. So here we have, you know, a classic uh, Twyman Green interferometer. We have our laser. We're coming into our uh, beam splitter. We have quarter wave plates so that we have uh, oppositely, you know, polarized beams again. We have our reference and our test surface. So there's the light going through. It comes back, you know, onto the camera. And again, you know, so this would be a classic uh, case. So you can actually make this quite small. And this is kind of uh, used a lot for measuring telescope mirrors. So you put a small diverger on the front of the interferometer here. And uh, now this could be, you know, several meters in diameter. And again, because it's uh, vibration immune, the interferometer can be most anywhere. Um, here's a normal Fizeau configuration um, where in order to do dynamic measurements, uh, here we have a hard time because our tests and reference are out here uh, beyond kind of a four or six inch collimator. It's uh, right now not possible to actually, you know, get a good quality uh, wave plate that will give me orthogonally polarized beams. So here's a case where if we want dynamic uh, performance, we can tilt the reference and we can do spatial carrier methods. But those are compatible with all, all of your standard Fizeau optics, and this would be used for flat testing prisms and all the normal things uh, you guys use Fizeaus for. And then you can actually kind of combine the two. So you can do an on-axis dynamic interferometer where if you watch the two pulses go through here, we actually have um, uh, two interferometers essentially, one over here and then, you know, the main test path. And we actually have two beams that are orthogonally polarized that leave the system, go to the test and reference plates and come back. And so we're actually able to then block out um, two of the beams that we don't want uh, that are combining the test and reference and actually just get a dynamic uh, measurement that's on axis using a Fizeau. Now this system gets a little complicated. It's a little more expensive. And this um, might have to be path matched depending on the coherence length of the system and some of your configurations. And then you can even, you know, employ it in a microscope-based uh, configuration. So again, we have our specialized camera with the polarizers. Um, but unlike a lot, if you guys uh, have used the Bruker or Vico system upstairs, or I think you guys have some Zygo uh, profilers as well, um, normally their objectives are Moreau or Twyman Green, uh, or Moreau or Michelson objectives. Um, here again, because we need opposite polarization, when we get to high magnifications where you can't use a, a Twyman Green or Michelson, uh, we're actually using a beam splitter and we have Linux objectives. So now the trick is these two objectives have to be perfectly matched in order to uh, get good results. But again, I'm going to have orthogonally polarized beams through the both of them, and I can combine that and get good results. Now the flip side of that is because you're using Linux objectives, you're not sacrificing your optical design to try and fit beam splitters and such in there. So you can get actually higher spatial resolution, higher numerical aperture uh, measurements uh, at a given magnification. Now we'll go a little bit into uh, applications uh, before we talk about uh, some rough surface measurements. But, uh, you know, on the microscope scale, you know, where, where is that important? So here we're, we've actually mounted a microscope-based system above a polishing machine. So it's actually uh, courtesy of Zico. So we're actually measuring the optic as it's being polished on a robot arm. And again, you know, that's not something you can ever do. We can get to nanometer level measurements um, in an environment with no isolation whatsoever. Another common thing is put it on a tripod and now you can directly go along and measure large optics. Uh, systems like this are used 
uh, by the telescope makers, by the laser uh, fusion systems, you know, anyone using large optics uh, that don't actually fit under a microscope-based system uh, and would be almost impossible to isolate in another case. You can use dynamic systems to measure them. And then here's a system that's doing, uh, you know, real-time gantry uh, measurements. And that's kind of the goal that everyone ultimately wants of 3D measurements. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. But ideally, people want 3D measurements as fast as 2D measurements. So what we always hear is 3D AOI, so 3D automated optical imaging. And this is, you know, you need a technique like this to even approach that. Uh, we're currently around, you know, 15, 30 frames a second with some of our systems. Uh, some can go a little higher um, in, you know, for certain periods of time. Uh, but of course, now that we're there, uh, and, and primarily it's slow because of processing, you know, of course, AOI systems are sitting there at 200 or 1,000 frames per second. But that's the goal always, is if you can give people 3D information in the same time they could just get a picture, there's an enormous amount you can do with that data for process control. Um, test configurations, you know, for uh, element and end-to-end -end testing, this just kind of shows with the James Webb Space Telescope, they have to test it all sorts of different ways. So they're going to test the secondary, they need to test the primary, they need to test the entire system. And again, you're talking about you know, many meters in length here. Um, there's no way you're going to isolate um, the interferometer or the environment for the test. And so here's, here's you know, a real picture of us in the lab measuring the telescope. So here's two people in their bunny suits, a dynamic interferometer, and your, you know, your test element is over here. So you know, this is the type of thing that dynamic interferometry is designed for, where there's just no other real recourse uh, to get the three-dimensional three data. Another nice thing about not needing isolation is you can measure into vacuum chambers. So here we're measuring into... Uh, not too bad. We're just, uh, in this case, at 60, minus 60 C. But for the web, we actually had to measure down to cryogenic temperatures. So, you know, that's not so good on your electronics and, uh, and your mechanical guys don't like you much. So you can leave the system outside of the chamber, look through a viewing window, and here, you know, we're testing. Here's the theoretical result and the actual result of the deformation um, as a thermal load is applied. Another uh, test tower, um, you know, we're looking at here. Uh, so again, this is, you know, I don't know, tens of meters tall, and we're looking at different mirror segments. So in this case, you would combine now dynamic interferometry with multi-wavelength interferometry, and you can do step measurements um, by resolving the, by effectively having a long effective wavelength uh, by using two, two beams that are very short. Uh, distance between the wavelengths. So we'll talk a little bit about rough surface measurements and uh, then a little bit about products and, uh, and wrap up here in uh, not too long. But um, you know, there's a, a few different ways now for rough surface. Uh, laser interferometers, of course, can only measure things that are maybe, you know, if your wavelength is 630, you can probably measure things that are about 15 nanometers RA or less. So shiny surfaces. Um, this is actually carbon fiber struts that are used as the backbone of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope again. Uh, black, rough, not very nice. And so how do you measure that and how it deforms? And what you can do is basically exactly the same interferometer configuration as we were having before, but now you'd use a speckle-based technique so an SP system. Uh, so you actually look at the speckles and how they change with time, and that's going to tell you deformation. So I can no longer do an absolute shape measurement uh, with a speckle interferometer, but I can do deformation measurements. And that's what they were doing here is, you know, how much is this strut deforming as it goes from, uh, you know, where we're building it at room temperature to cryogenic uh, space temperatures. And then another technique for uh, 
measuring rough surfaces, again involving fringes because you know, we love fringes at 4D, um, is structured light. So this is very similar in a way to deflectometry. I'm going to somehow project fringes onto a sample and how the fringes deform across the sample. So here's low frequency ones, here's higher frequency ones. I can use multiple exposures in this case to develop a three-dimensional picture of a surface. And, you know, where you see that a lot is if you watch people on TV with striped shirts, you can actually see how it, you know, conforms to their body and things. And, uh, again, typically to measure high versus low points, you're going to take multiple images. And so it's not very suitable for vibration-rich environments. But you can play the same tricks. So if we uh, do what's called polarized structured light, um, you can combine dynamic interferometry with fringe projection. So here we have a special, uh, well, a normal LED source. Uh, we linearly polarize it, and we go through what's called a polarization grading um, that actually creates two beams that are, uh, one's RCP and one's LCP, so oppositely polarized, um, that are at slight angles to one another. Those two beams, you know, propagate through the system. Uh, they hit the test surface, um, and essentially, you know, again, we're all common path here, we're all common path there, except for a very slight angular difference. Uh, and then we image it onto one of the pixelated cameras with the polarizers, and we can actually get a three-dimensional result in a single camera frame. And that's really pretty powerful. So uh, it's a great technique because, um, oops, must be timing on this. You can measure almost any surface with it. So semiconductors, carbon fibers, uh, aviation parts, and uh, you can actually configure this in a handheld unit that people can just bring anywhere and do three-dimensional measurements. Um, in fact, I was going to bring one today, but every single demo system we have is out right now, so I wasn't able to, but I'll, I'll show you what, how it's used in different configurations. Um, but it's a really powerful technique. Again, if you can bring metrology to parts rather than parts to metrology labs, uh, you open up a whole new universe of applications for people in terms of quality control. So then just a couple slides here on applying new technologies. Uh, something I really didn't get until, you know, you learn the hard way in industry. Um, and some of you are from there. But keep in mind as you guys are doing all your work and as you get out into the world and your engineering projects, customers never want a technology, right? I've yet to walk into someone and have them say, I really want you to make me an interferometer. They say, oh, I want you to measure this turbine blade. I want you to solve this quality issue. I need to improve yield. So they're wanting solutions. And always structure your conversation that way. Because if you immediately go in with the technology in mind, uh, chances are you're going to go down the wrong path. Because it might not be the right technology. It might be the only one you have. But uh, neither side is going to be happy if you're trying to shoehorn something. So think about you know, what the solution they want is and then what are the technologies appropriate for it. And maybe you can apply you know, what you're doing and maybe you can't. Um, but there's a ton of stuff out there. Um, you know, a lot of these are dated for you, but uh, you know, the Betamax you know, videotapes um, was a superior thing. It was cheaper. They could hold bigger movies. They were higher resolution. Uh, they failed. Um, the Sega Dreamcast, they say, was about 20 years ahead of its time. It was the first system to offer online gaming, and this is in the early 90s. Um, and everyone laughed at them and said no one would ever do online gaming, and it failed. Uh, this is actually from 1998, and uh, looks an awful lot like an Oculus Rift, uh, but they didn't, they didn't think about, you know, it was a technology in search of a problem at the time, and it didn't have infrastructure and things. So I, I once had an employee uh, in my research group, and a uh, brilliant person, but uh, we, we would make fun of him a lot because he would prototype something out, and it might take him a month or two or three. And then kind of hold up his hands and say, ah, oh, the rest is just engineering, right? 
which is now a two-year program involving seven or eight people. Um, but that's the important part. And, you know, you should stay involved all the way through the, the process because uh, if you have a, the best technology and you let someone else do the just engineering part, uh, chances are you're going to be really upset at the end of the day when uh, no one wants it. And so you always have to think about customer-centric questions, you know. So, and this, in, you know, even goes to like, you know, when you're showing things to your professors or, you know, the people that are funding you or anything else. It doesn't have to be, you know, a true commercial customer. But what's important to them? Um, on one of the systems we developed recently, I was talking to a guy in precision manufacturing, and he said, can I throw it against the wall? I'm like, well, why would you want to throw a precision optical instrument against the wall? He's like, well, my guys are going to do it. And if it can't be thrown against the wall, I don't want it in my factory because it's going to go down, and then I'm not going to be able to produce parts because I rely on it. So come back to me when, when it's robust. And uh, similarly on the software side, uh, certain industries, you know, people sometimes even in, in beta say, oh, you know, it's just a beta, the software crash. There's certain industries out there, you crash in the demo, that's it. Just leave. There's no point in continuing the conversation because you've ruined their trust in the product if within the first five or ten minutes of them seeing it, you're rebooting the computer. So think about things like that. Um, you know, how much sensitivity is there contamination, ESD? You know, how stable is it? You know, how often do I have to recalibrate? Uh, what happens, you know, we have a product that goes anywhere from the lab to uh, the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. So I was asked, you know, can your product work in 140 Fahrenheit? Okay, let's go test the product in the car in the summer in Tucson and see what happens. Um, and, you know, and I'm as guilty as everyone else. Scientists and engineers love adjustability, right? But eliminate as many as you possibly can. Um, you know, do I really need it, right? So sometimes people are like, well, yeah, usually it's 10%, but sometimes if I make it 9.72%, I get another 5% quality of data. Well, you know, what's the trade-off there? The more buttons and knobs and stuff you have for people, they get terrified, they think it's too complex to use. Um, even things that I've thought are very simple. You know, I've gone to customer sites where um, back when I was at, uh, at Vico, we had a sun icon, and that was the brightness control. And I went there, and they had never read the manual. It had gone through a few iterations. They had no idea you could click the sun icon and change the light level. So if you think something's obvious, um, it's not, or even maybe the first guy it is and not, you know. Can I hide some things? So maybe I have an advanced mode and a non-advanced mode. And really, this next one is the most critical. Once I get the data, how long before I get the answer? Right? And those are not the same thing. Um, another, you know, recently I was watching someone and they were trying to compare one of our products to another product. And uh, they measured on the other product. And then they had to transfer the data to the computer. Then they opened it up. And then they made some masks to mask out some of the surface. Uh, then they drew some different cursors. Then they did some tilt adjustments. Ten minutes later, they they had an answer for me that compared the two, and uh, um, you know that's that's not good, right? So, as as fast as you can think about what are all the steps someone has to do, um, it's good. I had another something I was in charge of. We sold a custom software package. Uh, I followed up with the guy two years or two months later. How's it working? Oh, I don't use it. Like, oh, we just didn't train you right. I'm going to write down step by step what you have to do from turning the instrument on to getting the data. 98 steps. I was embarrassed, right? I'm like, well, no wonder the guy's not using it. Um, I wouldn't use it, you know. But, I mean, for me, a lot of those were automatic. But if you had to map them out, you know, are my results compatible with existing techniques? So as you're going into areas... You know, one thing we learned is never ask a production house to change their, their drawings, right? If they're drawing, and it's why Peak to Valley 
is still a surface spec in the world, right? So now I have you know cameras that give me four million data points, and I'm going to pass fail the part based on two of them. Um, and it doesn't matter how many times you tell people that it's a terrible metric. It's the metric that's been on their drawing for 30 years, and they're not going to change it just for you, right? So, uh, you know, you can nudge them in the right direction. Um, and then does it look good? So um, we'll get to that. But here's, here's an example, maybe. Eh, this would have been an example of... Uh, of making a system easy to use. Essentially, you know, can you go from starting it up to getting a result, oh, there we go, in just a few seconds. So this is actually a structured light PSL system. You line it up. We're, uh, we color the screen green when it's in focus. You hit the button and they get their 3D result. Uh, here we're measuring a cylinder. Well, this guy didn't want to look at the cylinder. If you see, there's kind of a pit in the upper right or upper middle. Flatten the data out. There it is visually if he wants it. Um, or we automatically find the pits and give the result. And you can just go right to that screen. So if someone's doing inspection, you know, can you give them the answer, which was pit depth, in under five seconds? You know, what do you have to do to do that can be important. And then looks. So, you know, this or that, right? Those are exactly the same product, technically. All of the optics, all of the electronics, everything is in there, right? So this was our, our first pro prototype, and I think this was our uh, maybe fourth iteration or something on it, as we kept telling them, now you got to make it more rounded and stuff. But believe it or not, people look at the one on the right, and uh, it's kind of for the industrial machining audience. The guy's are like, wow, that looks like a ray gun. Right? And you immediately get buy-in from people because they think it's cool, right? I'm, I'm cool if I use that thing. I'm, you know, I'm a nerd if I use the one on the left, right? Or embarrassed or something. So don't discount looks or even uh, when I was at Wyco, you know, what sold more products than anything uh, in a way was we had a really sexy 3D data display, right? And, uh, and you go to places and, like, oh, they never used it for measurement, right? But when their manager came in the room, they could pull up that 3D data display and rotate it around and show them this awesome image. And literally, that would sell product, right? Way more than here's uh, the Six Sigma repeatability on, you know, measuring a silicon carbide flat or something. So I just wanted to, you know, get you guys always be thinking about, you know, who the end user is and how to make things just that little bit nicer, a little bit better to use, and it's really going to serve you well. I mean, it can really make or break, uh, make or break products. And even a funnier thing with this and and that other handheld unit, you know, we've been encouraged to put it to get a holster for it, because one of the kind of distant competitors had a holster, and they like sold twice what their direct competitor sold, just because guys like walking around on the shop floor with a holster, right? So, so there's a lot beyond technology to think of, and I just wanted to highlight a little bit of that. So uh, we're out of time here. So, you know, in conclusion, you know, you know, fringe-based techniques are really powerful, and you're going to find them all over, whether you're measuring macro shape or micro roughness or anything in between. And there's a lot of different varieties of it, deflectometry, uh, sp spatial... Uh, carrier techniques, uh, fringe projection, interferometry, but they're all very related. And so once you learn one, it's pretty easy to figure out, you know, what the pitfalls and strengths are of all the other ones. Uh, moving things to dynamic, you know, has a lot of power because you take the environment out, you take a lot of pain points away from the customer. And so it enables a lot of things that otherwise just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to happen, like live cell measurements. Um, interferometry, awesome for smooth. Um, structured light is great for rougher surfaces. And, you know, again, just in conclusion, you know, the, the technology and the numbers are awesome and they're kind of a prerequisite, but they're really only maybe 10 or 20% of the solution. 
So be thinking about, you know, even as you go doing things or when you're about to demo to someone, think about how to streamline everything. Anything you can make, you know, one click that was five clicks um, is going to make a huge impact on whoever you're showing your technology to. So that's me done. Uh, thanks for your time.